Good evening and welcome to Waterloo's 2021 Pod and Bill. Thank you so much for joining us today. As everyone's coming in, I'll go over the agenda for the event. We have four speakers lined up today. We started with an introduction to Waterloo from one of our project managers, Shahir, followed by our second project manager, Emrys, who will tell us about the history of the team. Next, two of our advisors, Professor Tiersha and Professor Nassar, will tell us about their experiences with Waterloo and explain some of the progress we have made in the past two years. After that, we're going to dive right into the Goose 5 pod with technical presentations from our sub-team leads. And lastly, we'll end the demo, pres demo projects from Mechanical Juniors, along with an optional Q&A session. During the event, we'll be monitoring the chat, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat feature either to the right or below the video, and we'll make sure to answer them at the end. So that pretty much sums up the agenda for tonight, so let's get right into it. The purpose of the event today is to show you the work we've been doing for the past two years on our fifth Hyperloop pod, Goose 5, the one you see behind me right now. Our sub-teams have been working very hard, especially these past few weeks, to add the finishing touches to the pod, so we're excited to finally be here after all the work we've put in. A lot of you have supported us from the very beginning of our journey with Goose 5, and now that we're at its end, we wanted you to be part of that too. We'd also like to say thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us and believing in our vision. You trusted in our abilities and we're really grateful to you for that. We really wouldn't have been able to do it without you. So to finally get the event started, I'll now pass it off to Shahir, one of our project managers, to talk about Hyperloop. Thank you, Drishti. At the heart of this world is transportation. Transportation to move people, transportation to move ideas, and transportation to move cargo. But I'd like to ask you, why? Why are humans always moving? Well, to answer this question, I'd like to present to you the three ideas of transportation. The first form of transportation were boats to cross the oceans. Today, the most advanced form of transportation are space shuttles to reach the stars. The idea behind them was the human desire to go where no one has ever gone before, the idea of discovery. Humans are obsessed with pushing the boundaries of what's possible, and that's why our transportation needs to go as far as possible and as fast as possible. But in order to convince other people to go with you, your transportation needs to be safe and reliable. And that takes us to idea two, reliability. Transportation brings the world closer together. Places that were once insurmountable distances away are now places where friends, family, and coworkers live. We truly live in a global economy where everything is connected by commerce, communication, and travel. And in order to keep up with that, we need to make sure our transportation is safe, long-lasting, and capable of moving people and resources and, and anything else that's part of this global ecosystem. And in this push for reliability, infrastructure has become more expensive than the actual vehicles we used to move around. For example, highways, roads, and railways are more expensive than cars, automobiles, and trains. And it's because things are so expensive, we need to make sure that they're a good investment for the future. And any good investment in the future is sustainable. And that takes us to idea three, sustainability. We built transportation to travel the planet, but we also need to take care of it. Our transportation needs to be scalable to meet growing population demands. It needs to be efficient and environmentally friendly, but also feasible for us to build and maintain for future generations. Now that we know about these three key ideas behind good transportation, we need to find something that can design the future of our ability to move around. And well, the answer to that is Hyperloop. The Hyperloop is a maglev train surrounded by a vacuum tunnel. It's the same price as existing maglev, but twice as fast. Let's face it, road trips suck. Automobiles are not good for long distance drives. And high speed rail is really expensive. You can look at maglevs in the places like Tokyo, but they only cap out at about 600 kilometers an hour. Hyperloop is about the same price and can travel at over twice the speed, over 1,000 kilometers an hour. Planes are fast but cheap and cheap, but only for really, really long distances. For places that are in between cars and planes, it's not very effective. So there's a small ideal gap where Hyperloop is a perfect fit. For example, a route from Toronto, Ottawa to Montreal would be ideal. This is about 600 kilometers long, something that would no normally take you about five and a half hours to drive. By Hyperloop, this would only take 45 minutes. That's right, it's unprecedented. Hyperloop truly is the fifth form of transportation. 
It reaches a new frontier that cars, trains, boats, and planes simply can't reach. But first, let's talk a little bit about what Hyperloop is. It's a maglev train in a vacuum tube, and that means it's an electric powered train, a lot like the regular trains you see today on the rails. By levitating, it removes the contact point between the pod and the actual track. So you're eliminating a lot of friction and also increasing the lifespan of the maglev train as there's no more wear and tear on the track and the wheels. And because we're so obsessed with speed, we're gonna make sure to take that maglev train and put it in a tube. And then by taking out all of the air, you're eliminating air resistance and that lets us go as fast as possible. So now that we know what a Hyperloop is, let's take a look at like, what the impacts of implementing this in society are. It's reliable enough to integrate into your day-to-day -day lifestyle. For example, you can live in one city and travel and work in another. The first implementation of Hyperloop won't actually be moving people. It'll actually be to move cargo. We can look at places like Saudi Arabia and other countries that are looking into implementing Hyperloop for effective and efficient transportation of cargo and for disaster relief. And as we've historically seen, Faster tran uh, transportation has always led to a faster paced economy. And we can see it scales well with our social requirements. There's lots of job opportunities that are generated by construction, ma maintaining, and improved accessibility with Hyperloop. And we can also see that with more travel opportunities, there'll be less strain on highways and roadways, and that improves productivity, as well as removing a lot of carbon emitters on the roads. And the Hyperloop itself, as an electric powered source, is really carbon efficient. So there's a lot of envir environmental benefits as well. But now you're wondering, where does Waterloop fit into this big picture? Well, we're a team of 110 students at the University of Waterloo. We've designed over five Hyperloop pods and building Canada's first Hyperloop track. We are on a mission to prove that Hyperloop is possible. And we will build and demonstrate a full-scale Hyperloop by 2025 to show that it is truly possible. Here's the roadmap. Well, today, we're showing you the fifth pod, which is behind me. And this proves that electromagnetic propulsion is possible. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Moving forward, when we're competing in competition, we'll be upgrading this pod to be even faster than what it already is. In the next two years or so, we'll be building a pod that completely levitates and a vacuum tube track to surround it. And then by 2025, we'll have a full scale Hyperloop demonstration right there for you to see. And looking on beyond that, Waterloop aims to become Canada's center of Hyperloop research. I'd now like to bring back Christy, who will introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Shakir. So next we want to introduce Emrys. He's been on the team since 2017 and worked on various sub-teams before becoming a project manager. Emrys is a really valuable member to our team, but having him as a project manager and working alongside him has turned a lot of our visions into reality. He's been in, in, with Waterloop from the beginning, with the goal of finishing Goose 5 while on the team. So today is an especially important moment for him. From the team, we just want to give you a huge thanks for everything you do, and we hope you can enjoy all the successes you have helped achieve today. Emrys will talk about the team and his experiences so far, including his work with our Goose 5 pod, a project very close to his heart. So without further ado, take it away, Emrys. Hi everyone, Emrys here and I want to talk a little bit about the story of our team, where we came from and where we're going next. So our team was founded in 2016 when Elon Musk's company SpaceX founded a worldwide Hyperloop competition for students to help accelerate the technology of Hyperloop and to publicize it. So Waterloop was one of the first teams that were founded as a response to this challenge. They were a small group of senior level engineering students and their mission was to build a pod to compete against other universities worldwide in the Hyperloop competition. So we competed for a few years and sometimes very successfully and other times not so much. Then in December 2019, the SpaceX competition came to a halt. Hyperloop teams worldwide, including ours of course, found ourselves unsure about the future. The future of our teams, our technology, and really just Hyperloop development overall. So we continued developing our, our pod we were eager to see the project through um, and continue building it, but we lacked a clear direction in our design efforts. Sure, we were building the pod, but what for if not for competition? This was a pretty difficult time in, in the history of the team because we struggled to figure out where we were going and what our, what our identity was as an organization. 
Around this time as well, in early 2020, the pandemic broke out and as we all know, it Im imposed a lot of logistical challenge challenges in our organization. It became clear that if we wanted to succeed as a team in really anything, we needed to define a clear vision beyond the competition. We needed to establish a mission, something long-term to which all of our members could align to and operate as one cohesive team with a single purpose. Basically a big dream to get us through the lockdown period and continue after that. Now, out of all the university teams, we've always had a really strong interest in innovating technology. We have a tendency to develop our own technology and systems rather than using off the shelf. And um, for example, we were the first team to use contactless eddy current brakes. We built a 5,000 PSI pneumatic levitation system. We built magnetic wheels for propulsion. And we were also one of the first teams to look into researching linear induction motors as a propulsion method. Now, <laughs> these design choices are full of unknowns. They're really risky. And they're not a smart choice if you're competing. But instead of competing to win, we always sought to push the Hyperloop technology forward. That's what inspires us. And so in the absence of the competition, we had a carte blanche to really define our direction. We had total design freedom, which is terrifying, but also very exciting. We had a great opportunity to focus on the technology that really interested us. And we also realized that the SpaceX competition's format, which was to reward the top speed of the pod, um, somewhat disincentivized teams from using innovative and new technology. So this is what became our new mission. We put together a plan, uh, something long-term, an idea that was planted in the team and which would outlast the current leadership and hopefully inspire all the next generations of students to come. We know a Hyperloop has to be fully contactless to be scalable. And this is something that's very difficult to achieve technologically speaking. So we broke it down into challenging yet achievable steps. So with each pod iteration, we'll tackle a key technical challenge. The first of these is in Goose 5 which is the pod that we're unveiling today. This pod aims to demonstrate the feasibility of contactless propulsion. In the long term, our goal is to build a fully contactless, stable Hyperloop pod by 2025. Now, if we want to develop all this, we're going to need a place to test all of our subsystems. That means a test track. I'm really proud to announce that we've secured real estate and materials and so in the new year, we're gonna be building a 100 meter long test track right here in Waterloo Region. The test track opens up yet another door. And so earlier, about a year ago, a small group of members from our team shifted away from Waterloo and built an all new organization, which is called the Canadian Hyperloop Competition. This is Canada's very own competition, which we can use to incentivize the technical development of Hyperloop in Canada. The CHC is now a team from all over Canada, independent of Waterloo, and is supported by eight partner universities. The first of these competitions will be held next year in the spring, right here in Waterloo, uh, Waterloo at the Waterloo Test Track. And even as we speak right now, the Canadian Hyperloop competition is hosting a virtual showcase of various teams around the world that are showcasing their systems. So that's a little bit about our team and where we came from in the last two years. And um, I'm really proud to say that this is where we're standing right now. And I'm also really excited about the prospect of all of our future developments. So thank you everyone for attending and I'll pass it back to Drishti for our next speakers. Take care. Thanks, Emrys. We hope that helped you learn more about our team structure, our values, our struggles, and how we overcame some of them. We also hope that helped explain some of our goals moving forward and what we plan to do in the next few years. Our next speaker is Professor Tierstra, who will talk about our team and the impact it has had on the community at the University of Waterloo. Professor Tierstra is the director of the Cedra Student Design Center at the University of Waterloo and oversees our team's timelines and helps out with logistics. 
He wasn't able to make it today, so he sent us a special message instead. Let's hear what he has to say. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, I'd like to start by offering my congratulations to the Waterloo team on their achievement, uh, completing the Goose 5 pod. I know the past couple of years have been very challenging for you, which makes today all that much more rewarding um, for yourselves as well as the university. You should all be really proud of your achievements. Um, the student teams at the Cedric's Student Design Centre overall have a significant impact on Waterloo's community and its students. Um, they provide learning opportunities and they not only reinforce material that's taught in the classroom through curriculum, but they also to help students and, and to develop new skills and experiences that can't be taught in the classroom. And if we look at the Waterloo team, they've distinguished themselves over the years by providing a wide variety of learning opportunities. They're almost tailor-made um, for our diverse multidisciplinary student body here at the University of Waterloo. If you look at the technical, their design, their technical knowledge, the opportunities they provide to students for skills development, um, for their members includes so many in areas of interest to students right now. Things like electric vehicles and future transportation, composites, lightweight fabrication. Um, these all are impacting our students and our community, but not only Waterloo, they're also having an impact on, on the co-op employers who, who, who employ these members as co-op students, right? They're seeing the benefit of this well. So great impact on not only Waterloo, but, but co-op as well. And in the past few years, the Waterloo team really has shown their resolve, their leadership in, in really tough times. Um, they've risen above the challenge of having a competition canceled, um, and they've helped to launch an interdisciplinary or an inter-university group to ensure that Hyperloop testing and competitions will continue uh, for many years to come. And they not only survived lockdowns and occupancy limits of COVID, but they were able to uh, complete the design and, and construction of their latest project that we're seeing today. The Waterloop team is a great example of what the SDC is all about. It's students gathering together with determination, with resolve, and always looking forward to what comes next. You've achieved much in the past year, and we're so happy to be here today to celebrate with you. Thanks, and take care. Thank you, Professor Tierstra. We look forward to continuing working with you. Next, I want to choose Professor Nassar. He's been our faculty advisor for two years and has helped us tackle some of the more technical questions about our pod. He's always there to offer help and have work sessions with our members, which is something we really appreciate as we continue to move towards building a fully levitating pod. I'll hand it off to him to talk about his experiences with our team. Okay, uh, the Hyperloop is um, the future of transportation. And when you look at uh, any uh, climate change task force, when they are speaking about how we can cut the carbon uh, footprint, they speak about the transportation, electrification of transportation. And one main issue with electrification of transportation is not the um, cars, it's about trucks, about cargo, about shipping. And there is a big challenge in how you can electrify or have an electric uh, truck. Uh, how, what battery size you will have, if you look at Tesla, they announced that they will have a they will have a, a, an EV truck, but this project is still have a lot of challenges. So the future is to have this car go through something like Hyperloop. And to see what is the importance of Hyperloop, try to play your uh, air hockey table without the air on. And you can see the friction that you will have. And turn on air and see how easy you can move your desk. So with Hyperloop, you have levitation, you are removing the friction. So it's much easier to push your um, put forward with less, less power. So we are not only um, electrifying the transportation, but we are making it more, more efficient. So, but this is very challenging. This is very challenging to a well-established industrial companies like Tesla. You can think about what the challenges that these students are facing. So this team is facing a lot of challenges that they are trying to solve and they are trying to come with innovative ideas to tackle. Uh, the, the motor we are using the LEM linear induction machine is not a standard motor. Uh, there is no too much information in textbook about this motor. So when you are doing design, you have to go through research papers. And I can see how the Waterloop team are reading research papers, they are coming up with equations, and they, they are tackling this from a very um, scientific 
point of view. It's not just a, a, a project that they are trying to lay around with it. They go to, into details, they learn the concepts, they, the, they learn the, the background. They went through a lot of issues in this project, and I, I was surprised with how innovative students were in, in coming up with solutions. And um, this team, um, how they are handling the database and how they are handling the lessons they learn from one uh, year to another, this is very surprising. So there is a data or there is a knowledge building uh, in this team. So each team is coming, they learn lessons, they document what they are learning, they document their designs, they document um, their findings, and next team starts from the where the other the last team stopped. So there is a continuation of the work and the design in this team. I'm, I'm really fortunate to be part of this team, and hopefully they are shaping the future of um, the Hyperloop, and they are coming with innovative ideas. Um, I, I think this is a very good example of how um, um, a, a design team can inspire researchers and can inspire professors to work in this area, in the LEM. They started with single-sided LEM, then they went to double-sided LEM, they changed the connections, they changed the design. Uh, so they went through a lot of uh, um, design procedures until they came up with this knowledge. Uh, hopefully they will, they will continue what they are doing, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Professor Nassar. From 4 a.m. testing sessions to 2 p.m. lectures, Professor Nassar has truly been with us every step of the way. Now, I'd like to move on to the next section of the presentation, where we'll be talking about the actual subteams. So, so here's the time for the showcase. We'll be showing the actual Goose 5 pod in movement. Lots of exciting stuff. Saw the pod moving, but how do we get it working? I'd like to invite Dexter up to talk more about the structure and guidance of the pod. Thank you, Shahir. I'm Dexter and I'm the current structure, structural and guidance team lead. The structural team is the core of the mechanical team. We focus on the skeleton of the pod, which includes the frame and guidance systems. The frame is the base of the pod where each of, and the, each of the other subsystems are mounted to, including the propulsion systems. 
The guidance system ensures uh, that the pod maintains its course on the track, accounting for various uh, variations and vibrations that may be induced, induced by the track on the pod. Here we can see some photos of the renders of the frame and guidance system on Goose 5. Um, the structural team worked long and hard on various research and design tasks to determine the ideal guidance system for Goose 5. Uh, we went through various mechanical design methods um, to design, prototype, and assemble these systems. Uh, this included some technical sketches and drawings, um, many 3D CAD models uh, used in SOLIDWORKS, um, and some computer-aided engineering simulations, as well as some various mathematical validation steps. Um, here we, uh, we utilize computer-aided engineering programs such as SOLIDWORKS uh, and ANSYS simulation to perform various finite element analysis simulations on each component of the structural and guidance systems. We performed a multitude of stress, strain, structural, and modal analysis um, to, determine, uh, to verify the me uh, mechanical integrity of each of the designs on the uh, frame and guidance systems. Uh, FEA simulations allow us to simulate the mechanical integrity of our designs before they're constructed. So we don't go ahead and spend hours uh, constructing a design only to find out that it doesn't perform as we expected it to. Additionally, stress and strain uh, values are especially important to simulate as the, if these values were to exceed our safety factors, the pod may deform or bend uh, more than we expect, um, causing uh, many components to fail and then cause the pod as a whole to fail. Um, here on the slide, we can see the output of various FEA simulations uh, completed on the frame. Um, and we can see in some of the photos, there are a lot of red areas that look a bit deformed. And that's where we expect to see, or where we simulated to see the most amount of deformation and deflection. Well, some of the lighter blue areas are where we can see the frame performing the best and it holding, its, uh, holding well and being very strong. Finally, we do many, many mathematical calculations to ensure that the structural system meets the exact requirements for the pod. For example, we had to analyze the technical specifications for our guidance shocks and calculate the pressure required in the main air chamber and negative air chamber so that the complete weight of the pod could be uh, supported during operation. Additionally, we performed uh, various hand calculations to verify our finite element analysis simulations uh, for the frame. Here in this slide, we can see uh, some of the technical specifications and graphs we did on the guidance shocks uh, that were essential for determining the air pressure. The results from the past two years of rigorous research and design, prototyping, and manufacturing uh, were to we developed our beautiful Goose 5 pod frame and our stellar guidance system that makes up the backbone of Goose 5. The frame is made out of 6,061 T6 aluminum square tubings welded together in a truss frame weighing in a total of 7 kilograms. We got the entire pod frame welded by one of our sponsors, Brent's Welding and Fabrication. And getting our pod fr uh, frame welded by professionally by one of our sponsors left us with a stronger and more reliable frame. The frame is designed to safely uh, withstand high-speed accelerations and decelerations. Uh, here in these photos, we can see um, some photos of our frame actually getting welded at Brent's Welding and Fabrication, as well as the render of our Goose 5 pod frame. Um, Specifically, we chose 6061 T6 aluminum frames and a space truss frame um, because this was determined to be the lightest frame possible that could best support the weight of our double-sided propulsion system. The guidance system consists of two top, two bottom, two lateral components, and eight dampener shocks in total. Each shock is specifically pressurized to support the 90 kilogram weight of the Goose 5 and maintain lateral and horizontal stability as the pod completes its run. Maintaining lateral stability is especially important on Goose 5 because we have very sensitive components that are sensitive to various deviations and separation in the track. For example, our uh, propulsion system is very sensitive uh, through the force, linear force that we get based on its deviation on the track. Despite the various uh, Device of, despite the various setbacks we had over the past two years, we're truly happy to present to you the structural systems uh, on Goose 5 and as, on the pod as a whole. Now I'll be handing it over to Adam to talk about our aeroshell team. Uh, hey guys, uh, my name is Adam and I'm going to talk a bit about the G5 aeroshell. Uh, so I actually have the aeroshell, we actually have the aeroshell here behind me. Uh, and the aeroshell is a protective aerodynamic cover uh, for the components beneath it. Uh, so for G5, we actually made our aeroshell out of carbon fiber. This was the first time we'd ever done this, and we learned a ton from it. 
Uh, so here's just a picture, uh, obviously, of the full shell. Uh, so now I'm just going to talk a bit about carbon fiber, just to give you all some background info. Uh, so carbon fiber is made of something called a tow, uh, which is essentially uh, just a bunch of fibers put together, which is the image on the left. And then these toes uh, are then weaved into various patterns. Uh, so the center top image, you can see 12K toe. What that means is there's 12,000 fibers per toe. Uh, to the right of that, you can see 3K toe, which just means 3,000, and that pattern continues. And then after these toes are weaved together, uh, the picture below that, you can see plane weave. This is also called a one by one plane weave. Essentially what that means is one over, one under. Uh, to the right of that, two by two twill weave. This is the most common type. You see it in a lot of cars. Uh, two over, two under, and then that pattern also continues. On the far right, you can see something called 4HS satin weave. Uh, and that's just an imbalance of over unders. So what that means is three over, one under, uh, and that will continue as well. Uh, so after uh, it's weaved, uh, you put a bunch of weaves into a certain geometry and then harden it in place using a resin. Uh, from here, uh, the result is an extremely lightweight, strong component and also looks pretty cool. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about how we actually made our part. Uh, so there's three parts to making any uh, carbon fiber part, uh, the, the mold, the layup and the weaves, and also post-production. Uh, so the first step, making the mold. Uh, there's many ways of producing a proper mold for a carbon fiber layup. Uh, the most common being out of fiberglass. But since our main constraint for our mold was our cost, the idea we came up with was to cut a block of styrofoam to the design of our aeroshell, uh, and then apply certain materials to this to return an extremely smooth mold surface, which is essential for an aerocarbon part. Our full mold was cut by a manufacturing company called Advantage Engineering from Windsor, Ontario, who sponsored the entire process. Uh, so on the left here, you can see uh, the mold in its early stages. In the center is the finished mold. And then on the right, it's just a simple rendering of all the materials that we actually applied to it. So next, I'm going to talk about the weaves and the layup that we used. Uh, so as the acceleration of the pod uh, was designed to be a maximum of 9.8 meters per second squared, that meant that the resulting forces on the aeroshell were a fraction of the yield stress of carbon fiber. Uh, so what this meant is there was actually a lot of possibilities for the number of weaves and the layers that we could use for it. So in the end, we went with four layers of 3K 2x2 twill, uh, which again is the most common type. Uh, and they were chosen for this aeroshell because they're relatively inexpensive, they have excellent conformity, which is essential for our complex geometry, and will also give us uh, the most closest to equal strength in all directions, which is also referred to as isotropic properties. Having said this, carbon fiber is very rigid, meaning that the areas of complex geometry will give it the highest strength. Uh, on the Goose 5 aeroshell, there are three flat faces running from the front of the shell to the back, and flat carbon fiber panels will have high strain when any stress is applied to them, something that was not ideal for our high stiffness constraint. By adding a foam core in between the four layers, which is the image in the bottom right, uh, we were able to achieve a much higher stiffness in these faces, hence it will not be affected by any vibrations given off by the pod. Uh, so now onto the layup method that we did. Uh, we went something called infusion. There's another, a, a couple ways to do this, uh, but we went with infusion because it's accurate, cost effective, and it can also be done in-house. So we infused our part this summer uh, using tooling resin from one of our partners, uh, Crosslink Technologies. So infusion actually includes uh, adding a peel ply, uh, which allows for separation when the infusion is done, and then adding a layer of mesh, which allows the resin to flow where we want it to, uh, and then finally vacuum bagging the mold, which pulls out all the air, and then it will also hold the carbon uh, onto the mold surface. Uh, so here's just two pictures of uh, our mold after it had actually been infused. So the darker areas are obviously where the carbon is and where they have absorbed the resin. Uh, so the third step is post-production. This stage consisted of trimming the composite, fixing the defects, and wrapping the pod. Since uh, carbon fiber parts are laid up with flanges, we were required to use power tools to trim the aeroshell to the geometry that we actually wanted. Uh, so now I'm just going to talk about kind of the most difficult thing we actually faced when manufacturing uh, this aeroshell. Uh, and what this was, was um, finding a solution to perform a single layup for the entire part. Uh, the difficulty of this came from the two faces uh, on the pod, which is in the bottom right image, uh, which would make the mold and layup preparation very difficult since they were upside down. So there was actually a second design that was thought of, uh, which was to split the geometry here uh, and then perform two separate layups, uh, bonding them together after. Uh, with the thought that we had one shot at this in mind, this was definitely the most feasible option. So after some quick calculations, we were able to find the required overlapping geometry to give us a secure bond, which would be the white part in that render. Uh, so after we had bonded the two composites, the last step in the process was sourcing a company that could wrap the pod for us. 
Uh, we found Limitless Wraps, which is a company in Waterloo uh, created by UW alumni who were very easy to work with and loved help, helping us get this done. Uh, so th these last, this last slide actually shows the final product. And now I hope everybody learned a lot. And I'm going to hand it off to Aaron to talk about the braking system. Thanks, Adam. On the braking team, we're in charge of making sure that in the event of a critical systems failure, the pod can safely come to a stop. The pod is quite heavy and will hit a very high speed, so our braking system has to be fast acting and robust in order to bring it to a stop. The pod uses pneumatic braking calipers from our sponsor, WC Branham, which you can see on the left side of your screen, and in co combination with the pneumatic circuit that we've designed, the brakes will automatically be actuated in the event of an electrical or mechanical failure. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a test run that we performed to verify that our brakes can work safely and effectively. Our pneumatic circuit starts at the tank, which holds 300 PSI air in order to have enough compressed air to actuate the brakes multiple times if necessary. A regulator then takes that high pressure 300 PSI air and regulates it down to 100 PSI, which is what the brake calipers need in order to open. Along the main path, path A, the normally closed solenoid chooses the pressure source for the brakes. When no current is being applied to the solenoid, the brakes are connected to the atmosphere, which closes them. When we apply current through the solenoid, the solenoid then switches to direct air from the high pressure side of the circuit into the brakes, which then opens them. This system allows for the pod to be instantly brought to a stop in an emergency, such as an electrical failure, as the brakes can only be open and the pod can only move when it has a working power source. Pictured here is what the circuit looks like when it's been implemented into the pod. The result of our design is an extremely safe and reliable braking system with a braking deceleration rate of 6.18 meters per second squared. It accomplishes all of this while not damaging the test track and requiring very little maintenance between uses. Next, I'll pass it off to Rinam to talk about the battery. That's really re interesting, Aaron. I'm Rhythm and I'm going to be talking about the main high voltage battery. On the battery team, we are tasked with designing the main power system for the vehicle. There are many subsystems on the pod, especially the propulsion and the braking system which require large amounts of energy. For this, the pod uses a custom designed battery which specially picks cells from grid power. The design of the battery uses 14 light pole pouch cells. Each cell has a voltage of 3.7 volts and are connected in series to make the total voltage of the battery 51.8 volts. The mechanical design of the battery is modul modular too. The battery has a total weight of 3.66 kilograms and is about the size of a football. In the battery, the cells are separated by aluminum and neoprene sheets. The aluminum plates allow for the heat to be dissipated effectively to prevent the cells from overheating. There are also temperature sensors between the cells to monitor the temperatures. The neoprene sheets compress to keep the cells under a light amount of pressure to hold the device together. The overall battery is held together with this type of a friction and pressure design. Manufacturing the battery required the use of various tools in the machine shop. Most of the 2D metal parts were made using a water jet cutter, which uses a high pressure controlled beam of water to cut through sheets of metal. Most of the top of the battery is 3D printed, which involves creating 3D parts by adding thin layers of plastic on top of the previous to create very precise and complicated designs. The cells are kept in contact with copper plates that are screwed down. If we do not have this, the battery voltage and the current could be unsafe and inconsistent, or even significantly lower than we predicted. The design keeps the battery electrical contact strong, and the non-conductive 3D printed parts on top keep the battery safe. The large terminals on the battery are the main contact, point, uh, contact points of power. A custom enclosure was also designed to keep the battery more secure and safe when on the pod. Additionally, simulations were done, to, done on the battery as shown to ensure the pod was able, to ensure the battery was able to handle the high speed forces that the pod goes through. Overall, the, pod, the battery is one complicated design that is very dense in power and we gained a lot of experience manufacturing it. Next, I'll hand it off to Bruce, who's going to talk about one of the most integral components that the battery powers, the linear induction motor. Thanks, Rindam. 
So hey everyone, uh, I am Bruce and I will be talking about the linear induction motor which is the propulsion system that we are using for the G5 pod. So first, before I start with anything else, I would like to first uh, explain the induction process. So a basic induction example can be visualized with uh, two magnets. Due to the magnetic poles of the magnets, attraction will naturally occur when two magnets are placed close to each other. Then imagining uh, two magnets being, close, uh, being placed close together with one on top and the other on the bottom, if the bottom magnet is moved slightly forward, the second magnet will be attracted and move closer to the first magnet. This effect can be loosely defined as induction, which is a fundamental principle behind our propulsion system. So the current limb core that is being used on G5 pod is the Polaris core. The Polaris core, much like all previous cores that we have used, consists of stacking sheets of silicon steel, also known as laminations, and electrically insulating each lamination with epoxy. It is currently the largest limb core that we have ever used, sitting at 29 inches, or approximately 0.75 meters long, and having a combined weight of 70 pounds each with, uh, with uh, 70 pounds with the coils attached. Its design also incorporates the data collected from past iterations of motor design to ensure maximum performance. And it is important to note that our design here consists of a D-limb, or double-sided limb, which uh, essentially just uses two motors instead of one. So for our pod, we uh, use current carrying wires around our cord to create magnetic poles across the motor. By using these poles, we're able to generate uh, an induction effect between motor and the track, uh, much like the induction process that I explained earlier. However, unlike magnets where the attraction only occurs once, we are able to use certain factors to produce continuous induction process. One of such important factors is the configuration of our motors, which directly determines its performance. The Polaris runs on a three-phase AC uh, configuration Due to the fluctuating nature of an alternating current supply, a three-phase system ensures that the motor can supply consistent thrust force to our pod, uh, as opposed to giving short bursts of power. The three-phase system can be seen on uh, the slide uh, there, uh, the graph there. The phase are then uh, implemented onto the motor uh, in the form of coils consisting of uh, turns of 22 gauge copper wire, all of which are hand wound and placed into the teeth of the Polaris to achieve a four pole motor. On the uh, right hand side, we can see that the Polaris is actually mounted onto the bottom of the pod and uh, with the D limb uh, teeth facing inward uh, towards the I beam. So, in order to generate the magnetic field that we need, we use uh, a battery system which uh, supplies around 44.4 uh, uh, volts of power. And for control, we use the Robotech uh, motor controller, which allows us to adjust the power being supplied to the motor. Under normal operating conditions, the motors will draw around one to three amps each. So for the past few months, uh, the LIM team has been working uh, tirelessly to uh, test and integrate motors onto the pod. This includes various forms of testing, as well as debugging that we performed uh, throughout uh, the course of a few months. Uh, and we also ran into many technical difficulties along the way, such as uh, spacing and mechanical fit, but we were able to ultimately work through that and uh, ultimately mount the motors to a correct fit onto the pod. So uh, yeah, the final slide uh, shows the, the work that we have been doing for the past three months in action. These simple experiments show without a doubt that these motors can produce thrust force and can actually move the plates. Next, I will be handing it off to Jennifer, who will be talking about the battery management system. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. I am Jennifer from the battery management systems team. So like the name suggests, we are responsible for monitoring and sustaining the battery's health. So the battery pack is made up of many individual battery cells. And for G5, there are currently 14 cells connected in series. 
So we want to be able to monitor these cells for their voltages and temperatures in real time. So having these measurements will allow us to perform actions such as cell balancing, which is the process of equalizing the state of charge among all cells. This allows us to preserve battery life over repetitive charging cycles, or else we will have cells that are more degraded than others. Another key feature of BMS is to engage the contactor, which isolates the battery pack from the rest of the system. This allows us to prevent possible safety hazards such as overvoltage. In order to achieve this, we have designed two main components the slave and master BMS boards. So firstly, about the slave board, which is sitting on top of the battery pack. Its main purpose is to have direct connection with each individual battery cell. So we chose the chip LTC6813 for two main reasons. Firstly, it is compatible of measuring up to 18 cells, which is enough for our purpose. Secondly, it allows for ISO spy which is a type of spike communication protocol designed for a high noise environment like inside the battery pack. It is able to retrieve information about the voltage and temperature for each of the 14 cells and may communicate this to the master board. So this is our second revision of the slave board and the key feature is that we replace the headers with pogo pins to have contact with the cells. So here's the photo of the slave board showing the pogo pins. And when being screwed on, it allows for a firm connection. This way, it reduces parasitic resistance as well as the need for crimping multiple connectors. Moving on to the master board. So show on the screen is an overview of the schematics that make up the different parts of this board. The schematics and PCB layouts were created using the software Altium Designer. So we shout out to our sponsor Altium for providing us with this amazing software to design our boards with. So now we'll be talking about what the master board is used for. So when the battery is turned on, an instantaneous inrush current enters the system. Being the first subsystem encountered by the battery, the master BMS board has a pre-charge circuit in place that prevents the inrush current from damaging the rest of the circuitry. And when the capacitor is charged, the contactor is engaged, which allows the current to flow to the motor control subsystem. When the master BMS board receives data which shows that cells are not operating within the specified values, it will trigger faults. So these faults include over and under voltage, over current, and over temperature protections. If any of these conditions are met, the contactor will be engaged to isolate the battery pack from the rest of the system for safety. Next, the MCU selected for this board was the STM32F405. We chose this because it is capable of handling the various features of BMS. It has the necessary communication peripherals such as CAN and SPI. And the one circled now are the LTC6820 chips, and these are responsible for converting the SPI to ISO SPI signals in order to communicate with the slave board. And another feature of the board is a direct current voltage converter, which takes the 45 volts from the battery and brings it down to 12 volts. This allows power to be supplied to other lower voltage subsystems. So here are the photos of the boards. So show on the left is the slave board and on the right is the master board. So the master is able to perform sensing, engage the contactor and have communications with the slave. Next, I'll be passing it on to Dev to talk about the motor controller team. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm Dev, and I, along with Ellen, are the current motor control team leads. The motor control team is responsible for creating a custom motor controller that is able to generate the appropriate signals required to drive the limb. The output signals of the motor controller need to be generated such that starting, moving, and stopping the limb can be done accurately. In addition, the controller must be able to be controlled manually as well as run on autopilot, where constant sensing for voltage, current, temperature, and even acceleration is taken. Next, I'll be talking about how we went about designing the motor controller. But before that, it's important to know what SVPWM signals are and how we use them. Here, we see a visualization of the three-phase sinusoidal system and its equivalent space vector on the left. The goal of space vector pulse wave modulation, or SVPWM for short, is to generate a rotating magnetic field in the primary of the motor, which causes the secondary to so-called chase the primary. 
This, in turn, creates thrust. SVPWM uses some basic linear algebra to determine how to switch the motor controller switches so that we can recreate a magnetic field pointing in any direction. This is done about 10,000 times a second, and this is referred to as a switching frequency. It can vary depending on a number of factors, uh, but this frequent switching is done to create a smooth rotating magnetic field. Now that we understand what SVP, SVPWM is, let's talk more about the motor controller. The team has decided to split up the motor controller into two separate boards for G5.5. The controller has been broken up into a logic board, which houses all the low voltage components, such as the MTU, and a power board, which houses all the high voltage electronics and performs as a non-isolated gate driver. The purpose of breaking up the controller into two parts is to simplify prototyping before we commit to a design. This approach allows the motor controller to remain modular, easy to assemble, and flexible for future enhancements. Here on the screen, you can see our initial schematic for the logic board, which is primarily responsible for generating the SVP WM signals we talked about earlier, which is in turn sent to the power board, which will drive a three-phase motor, which Bruce talked about earlier in the presentation. Sensing data is also taken constantly to make decisions when on autopilot mode. This also results in an added protection against overloads and electrical faults, as we can safely stop the pod and enter a fault state if safe operating conditions are not met. Now, you see our initial schematic for the power board on the screen, which takes in the low voltage SVPWM signals from the logic board and produces the appropriate switching frequency at a much higher voltage to drive the end channel MOSFETs that are designed to be in a three phase inverter configuration to drive the limb. To accomplish all this, we have used Altium Designer in order to seamlessly design the schematics and layouts of our boards. In addition, PSIM has been and will continue to be a great tool in the development of our motor controllers by allowing us to simulate various configurations of the controller and testing control theory. We'd like to thank both Altium and PSIM for sponsoring us and being a vital component of our development. The result of all this development is a logic and power board that are going through intensive tests to validate their performance and functionality. In addition, we previously used an off-the-shelf uh, motor controller for G5, so the team is very excited to be able to incorporate an in-house designed and tested controller. Next, I'll be passing it on to Alfonso to talk about the embedded team. Thanks, Dev. Um, I am Alfonso, your resident embedded lead. Oh. Yeah. Hi, Dev. Um, yeah, thanks, Dev. I am Alfonso, your resident embedded lead for the team, and I'm here to talk about all the non battery related sensors and low voltage distribution within the pod. Um, our pod is a remotely controlled vehicle. In order to ensure its safe operation, we know what is going on inside the pod. Uh, we need, um, yeah, we must know what is going on inside the pod. We do this through a network of sensors, each capturing data and relaying it from the vehicle to the operator outside. These sensors measure data such as battery voltage, current and temperature from our low voltage uh, battery, pod acceleration, speed and distance, motor temperature, braking line pressure, and braking on and off control. This is called the embedded system. Um, the general architecture of the embedded system consists of a series of sensors and printed circuit boards, along with a central computer. Each sensor needs both power and signal connections. The power lines power the sensor, and, and the signals relay the measured data from the sensor to the pod. To do this, we have each sensor connected to small control boards, which receive an analog signal from the sensor and convert it into a CAN frame, which is what gets sent to the central computer. There's a good reason for switching from analog to CAM. While analog signals are very simple to set up, they are very susceptible to noise, especially EMI noise from higher power and higher frequency lines running along the pod. CAN is a very robust protocol and works well even over longer distances, such as two meters. We designed a general control board for the sensors in-house and then modified the base design to be compatible with each of the specific sensors that we selected. 
here you can see uh, general. Yeah, here you can see the general uh, sensor board on the left, and in the middle, um, you can see the Model Five versions uh, for temperature and pressure sensing, respectively. There are a lot of sensors on the market, and each of them have their own features, price, points, and form factors. Most of the sensors on the pod are analog. This means a certain fixed voltage is sent to the sensor through one wire. Inside the sensor, there is a sensing element, such as a resistor, whose value changes with respect to the characteristic being measured. Uh, some voltage is fed inside the sensor, and then we measure the voltage coming out of the sensor and correlate it to the sensor reading based on a simple mathematical equation. To give you a concrete example, we required a pressure sensor to measure the air pressure from the brake lines. The system is expected to always operate somewhere between 0 and 100 PSI, so we chose a sensor which measures very accurately at those pressure ranges. The pressure sensor requires 5 volt input for power, then depending on the pressure it is subjected to, it outputs a smaller voltage. For example, 70 PSI, uh, the output of the sensor might be 3.5 volts. Based on measuring the output voltage, we can calculate the corresponding pressure through an EDC. Once all of the sensors are spec'd, we need to power them. A lot of the sensors require 5 volt supplies, while others require 12 volt 24. The, bra the brake pressure sensors require 24 volts. In order to supply each device with its, with its required power, we designed a low voltage distribution board. It features 5 volt, 12 volt, and 24 volt rails according to our requirements, and is powered by a simple 22 volt LiPo battery. An enclosure protects the system from dust or damage while being easily removable to the, replace the battery when it runs low. Um, the last piece of the puzzle is the central computer, which facilitates communication across the onboard electronic electrical components, which include the embedded motor controller and battery management systems. In our system, a Raspberry Pi receives information from the different ports throughout the pod, and depending on the system, it sends out a command signal to engage or disengage various actuators. Now we'll have Guy talking about the software side of these systems, and then Quinn will soon be showing you how the pods functions are automated and how we communicate with and control the electro electrical devices. Thanks, Alfonso. My name is Guy, and I will be talking about the firmware subsection of Waterloop. The role of the firmware team the role of the firmware team is to write the code for the microcontrollers found on the embedded boards Alfonso just talked about. A microcontroller is a miniature programmable computer that we can program to write and write instructions on to be written in the memory to be ran at a later time. The microcontroller has multiple input and output pins that allow us to interact with other components on the board. For most boards, the firmware written is minimal, as a lot of the work is offloaded to the physical electronics. However, a common role among all embedded boards is to provide their data as a diagnostic, whether it's the temperature from the temperature sensor, pressure from the pressure sensor, current from our distribution boards, or so on. The data is sent periodically in something called a heartbeat, along the wires that travel up and down the pod, called the CAN bus. The data is aggregated onto the relay board, which is a Raspberry Pi, and sent over Wi-Fi to the desktop. Of, of all the embedded boards, the one that is the most complicated board is that of the, uh, the firmware team works on is the battery management system. As a whole, the BMS is a complicated system that has multiple components to keep track of at once. To orchestrate the different pieces of the system, a real-time operating system, or an RTOS, was implemented on the master board. The role of the RTOS is to simulate multi-threading on the single cord microcontroller and to meet deadlines for time-sensitive operations to allow us to organize the functions of the BMS into separate threads with varying priorities. The different threads are the measurements thread, the can heartbeat thread, the coulomb counting thread, and the state machine thread. The state machine thread is the implementation of the BMS state machine. This is responsible for managing the various functions of the board, such as pre-charging, bouncing, and discharging. In addition, the BMS state machine monitors the current and voltage of the battery as a whole and of individual cells and warns of the general pod state of any normal dangers and severe danger faults and uh, that can be caused by small and extreme voltage, current, and temperature sensors for the individual cells or for the battery as a whole. The CAN heartbeat thread is the same heartbeat that was discussed earlier, but as a separate thread, so it will occur at the same time as the other uh, functionalities of the board. 
To monitor the state of charge of the battery, the Coulomb County thread runs an algorithm to use trapezoidal integration of the current going through the battery over time. The algorithm gives us a good estimate of the state of charge, which is the level of charge in the battery relative to its capacity, which allows us to know how much power we have left in the pod. Finally, the last thread is the measurements thread. This thread is responsible for providing the data for the rest of the threads to use by making measurements including measuring currents, voltage, and temperatures. One of the key tools that the measurement thread uses is the slave drivers. The drivers enable communication between the master board and the slave board. The master sends commands to the slave board, which then responds with the data that it was requested. This enables communications between the two boards, which allows us to determine data such as current and voltage of individual cells. Overall, the former team works to get the embedded boards up and running and integrating the various functions of the pod together so we can run Goose 5 efficiently and safely. I'll now pass it off to Quinn, who will talk about the communication systems on the pod. Thanks, Gary. Hi, everyone. My name is Quinn. I'm the communications lead here at Waterloo. The main focus of my team's work and what I'll be talking about today is the implementation of a system-wide state machine. Our pod state machine is currently made up of seven distinct states. Resting, where all of our pod systems are off. Low voltage, where our primary boards are on and communicating. Armed, where our power is connected to the motor controller. Autopilot, where the motor controller is powering the motor and the pod is being propelled down the track. Braking, where the motor is turned off and the brakes are engaged. Emergency braking, which is triggered when our, one of our systems has failed and the pod has to stop moving. And lastly, system failure, which can occur when once the pod stopped, all of our pod systems will turn themselves off and it indicates that the pod is ready to be approached. During each of these states, our subsystems are expected to be performing specific procedures. Given that each of these different subsystems rely on each other, you might be wondering how our systems stay in sync. The answer to that question is our CAM protocol. But what is a CAM protocol? A CAM protocol is a set of messages which our boards use to send data over a controller area network, or CAN. What makes a CAN special is the way that it determines when different devices can send messages on the network bus, the bus being the pair of wires that every board is connected to. To make sure that only one device is communicating on the CAN bus at a time, each message in our protocol is given a unique priority level. The CAN system then ensures that if at any point more than one device wants to send a message, the message will always be sent in order of priority. Our CAN protocol is broken down into two types of messages, telemetry messages and state messages. The role of telemetry messages is twofold. Its first is to inform the pod's operator and other systems about critical information, such as the battery's voltage, how much current the motor is drawing, and the temperature of critical parts of our pod. Each system is aware of the safe ranges for these values and can actively make corrections should one of the values begin to swing beyond its acceptable minimum or maximum value. These ranges are also displayed to the operator so that during operation, we can prematurely end a run if values begin to approach those boundaries. The second role of the telemetry messages is to act as a heartbeat for the system. This means that every system is required to send a telemetry message on a regular interval, and all the other systems are required to track the time since the last message that they received from the other systems. If a system registers that it's not received a message from another system in a while, then it will enter into an air state and attempt to notify the other devices of such. State messages, on the other hand, enable op the operator to request a transition in the pod state machine. They also allow systems to notify each other when they have successfully transitioned to a new state or if they're entering into an air state. In general, the control flow for a pod goes as follows. The operator will enter a command into the desktop to trigger a state transition. A relay board will take the message that comes in over a Wi-Fi network and translate it into a state request CAM message. Each board will then receive the request and begin the transition procedure. When a system finishes transitioning, it will send a message back to the relay board signaling that the transition is complete. After all of the acknowledgments have been received from each system, the relay board will send a message to the desktop indica indicating that the transition was successful. Now, that was the general flow. But what happens when things go wrong? 
There are two types of errors that we need to be able to handle, internal and external errors. An external error is any issue that occurs in the communication between our pod and our controller. The main reason for an external error can occur is due to a failure in the Wi-Fi network, whether it be issues with the antenna on board, at the desktop, or at the router. When an external error occurs, a relay board will start a process of sending state messages to return the pod to low voltage state. The procedure is available here, but the general idea is to stop the pod, disconnect the high voltage battery, and then return to a low voltage state where the desktop can try to connect to the relay board again. Internal errors, on the other hand, encompass any error that can occur in our pod subsystems. If the pod encounters an internal error, then it will transition into one of the two error states depending on if the pod was moving when the error was detected. There are two reasons that the pod can encounter an internal error. The first is if a pod detects a sensor reading which is outside of the safe range of values. If this is the case, the board will send a state message to begin the emergency procedure. This will cause all other systems to enter into their emergency shutdown procedure and stop the pod. The second case is if a board fails or becomes disconnected from the town bus. In this case, the failing board will no longer be sending its heartbeat. And as noted before, when the messages from the other boards will notice the lack of messages from the fail board and begin to enter their error procedures, enabling the pod to stop. It's thanks to this heartbeat system that it allows us to safely control an operator <coughs> pod. I'll now pass it back to Shahir to continue on with the presentation. All right, thank you, Quinn. So at this point, we've covered just about every subsystem from mechanical, electrical, software, and limb. So we're moving on to a slightly different portion of the event. So each of the mechanical juniors on the team has selected a subsystem that they decided to build a model on. And they'll be explaining that model in quite a bit of detail. So today, you'll be seeing the mechanical juniors showcase their projects, namely the ring encoder, the guidance system, the powertrain, and finally, the braking system. So let's take a look at what the Mechanical Juniors have brought out for us today. First up is the ring encoder. Hi everyone, I'm Thomas and this is Kaylee and we've made a demonstration of the ring encoder system on the pod. The ring encoder is used to determine the speed of rotation of the wheels on the pod. This measures the speed in real time, which is important to control the pod's linear induction motors. Yeah, so there's multiple different types of encoders. So why did we choose the rotary encoder? Well, this is because the wheels are free spinning. The axle is fixed and the wheel spins on a bearing instead of entire, the entire axle spinning. This rules out the vast majority of commercial encoders since they require mounting directly onto the axle. The other option was a magnetic ring encoder. However, with this option, we would run into problems with linear induction motor interference. So what is the rotary encoder? It's an embedded device that measures speed. Rotary encoders, like the one used on the pod, consists of an emitter and a reflective phototransistor. This observes a pattern of light and dark stripes on a surface. When the emitter shines on a light colored stripe, the phototransistor picks up on a positive signal. And when it shines on a dark colored stripe, it picks up on a negative signal. And with these signals, we can get the number of pulses per rotation. Using that and the radius of the wheel, we can calculate the linear speed of the pod. For our demo, we've made a scaled up version of the ring encoder panel of the pod. This is the wheel. As you can see, it has a pattern of dark and light colored areas around the outside. This is so the ring encoder can measure the speed of the wheel. The wheel is on a shaft, which is connected to some bearings, which allows the entire system to freely spin. So next to the wheel is the phototransistor and the emitter. We've used an IR sensor to detect and measure the light and dark areas on the wheel. The readings from this sensor are used to calculate the speed of the wheel. The sensor senses data to a microcontroller. We are using an Arduino for our demo. It takes the readings made by the phototransistor and calculates the speed of the wheel. The Arduino is connected to an LCD display, which displays the calculated speed of the wheel in real time. And so that's the end of our demo, and we hope that you learned something new about the ring encoder on the pod. Next up is the guidance demo. Hi everyone, I'm Miklos. And I'm Kalen, and we're junior members on the mechanical team. Today we're here to demonstrate how the guidance system on Goose 5 works, but first, what does the guidance system actually do? Well, as you might have guessed by the name, it helps keep the pod running along the track, but it also gives stability to help with parts that are susceptible to jarring and maintains a uniform air gap for the linear induction motor. 
And so first of all, there are three main parts to the guidance system. We have top guidance, lateral guidance, and bottom guidance. So first of all is top guidance, which is right here, and also on the other side is the same. So what top guidance does is it carries the weight of the pod and also keeps the bottom of the pod from scraping on the top of the I-beam. And another feature of top guidance is that when we have an obstruction on the track, the pod will continue rolling over the obstruction on its original path. And instead of the pod moving upwards, the top guidance springs will simply compress. And one last thing is that here on our demonstration, we have springs, but on the actual pod, those are pneumatic shocks. And next up is the bottom guidance, as can be seen right here. It's probably the simplest of the three sub-assemblies. Its job is simply to stay under the I-beam, and in the case of hitting an obstruction, if the pod was to go airborne, it would maintain its track along the I-beam instead of going flying off. All right, and then finally we have lateral guidance, which are these two on the side, and then there's also two here on the other side of the pod. So what lateral guidance does is it keeps the pod centered on the I-beam and also horizontal. So here we have springs again, which on the actual pod are pneumatic shocks. And what the springs do is they apply a vertical force downwards, which then get converted into a horizontal force. That horizontal force pushes those two wheels right there and there into the side of the I-beam, thus again, keeping the pod horizontal and centered. And it also gives that uniform air gap, which is extremely important for the linear induction motor, because if that distance was to vary, the forces would as well, and that diminishes our ability to control and measure the speed of the pod, which is not good. All right, and that's everything for our dance guidance demonstration. I hope that you learned something new. And thank you for your time. Next up is the powertrain demo. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the G5 pod powertrain demonstration. I'm Eric. And I'm Amon. To start things off, we are going to give you a brief overview of how our pod G5 pod moves and what a powertrain system is. So first, for some background information, a powertrain uh, refers to the assembly of all the components of the entire system, uh, in this case the G5 pod itself, which brings the system into motion. So for the G5 pod, this will be the two linear induction motors that span the length of the pod. And linear induction motors is LIM for short. Now, uh, unlike the motors that we're familiar with today, uh, you'll quickly realize that th with these limbs, such as this, there are no rotating shafts that connect to, say, a wheel or a gear. So, now you'll be wondering how are these, how are the limbs going, how are these two limbs going to move this metal piece without having any moving parts? Well, that's actually quite complicated. But we can imagine that the limbs are as regular motors, but then cut and laid out flat in a line. In this case, the rotating shaft is this metal piece that's laid out, and the limbs are like the three-phase induction motor that's cut open and laid out parallel to the rotating shaft, which is the metal piece in this case, which will be moving. Now, moving on to our actual demonstration, as you can see here, we have prepared a smaller scale linear induction motor, uh, similar to what you would find with the regular size limbs on the G5 pod. However, instead of having the limb move, we'll be having the track itself move in order to simulate the movement of the pod. Now, in this bin filled with water, uh, we placed a regular sheet of aluminum on top of a uh, piece of foam, such that it flows on the surface of the water right underneath the mini lid. Uh, and now when we power up the limb later, you'll be able to see that this track is being moved across the limb uh, by the induction from the mini limb that we have up here. So in terms of the electronics we have set up, please note that this does not represent the electronics for the G5 pod itself. This is just for the demonstration purposes. So, in this, in, in the electronics we use for this is STM32 board plus a motor driver board, which is DRV8305 to power the mini limb induction limb on and off. So what it will be doing, it will be moving from right to left, and from and then we'll let it rest, and then it will move back. So we will give it some time to time for it to relax. However, we can't keep it on for so long because since the the power is too high, it it heats up the coil and which will cause it to burn so we'll let it rest for a bit so moving on to our actual demonstration uh, please uh, take a look at the aluminum piece so as you can see uh, when we turn on our limb you'll be able to see that the aluminum sheet starts to move across the temperature is good yeah all right so thank you for listening to our demonstration and we hope you enjoy 
And lastly, we have the braking system. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm Julian. And we made a demo of the braking system that's found on the pod. So, the braking system is very important, especially when the pod is going at very high speeds. This specific braking system is designed in a way that it'll outlast any mechanical and electrical failures that could possibly happen while the pod is in motion. So I'm going to talk about the mechanical failures. So if there's any leak in the system, uh, we made sure that the clamps are always closed on the I-beam, which is the track that the pod is running on, and this spring ensures that these clamps are always closed. And for the electrical failure side of it, when the solenoid is turned on, compressed air is now able to go through the solenoid, ultimately opening the brakes, and then when the air is no longer being sent through as the solenoid is turned off, there's not enough pressure going through, so the brakes will now close. As you can see right now, the brakes are closed as this load cell uh, is detecting uh, force on the brakes. So we're going to watch. As you can see here, the pressure valve is going to turn on as I open the compressed air and send it through the system. And we'll watch the change in pressure as it goes through the solenoid over to the next one and opening the braking calipers. So we'll turn that on now. So as we can see, it's open, and now there's pressure being sent through the first pressure valve. It's going through the regulator, down through the diverting hand valve into the solenoid. The solenoid is off, that's why the brakes are now closed. And now I'm gonna turn the solenoid on, and the brakes should open. And the brakes open, and then when I close the solenoid again, the brakes are The brakes are now gonna close, which then, when lined up, we'll put force on top of that, and we'll be able to read it down at the bottom. So we'll do that again, we'll open it, and you can see so opening the brakes, you can see the value change. Let me close it again. And uh, it's now closed. Yes. And there you have it. We hope you learned a thing or two about the braking system that's found on the pod, as well as how it's designed in a way to outlast any of those mechanical or electrical failures that could occur. Thank you to our mechanical juniors for walking us through those subsystems. We hope that helped you visualize how some of the systems on the loop is something we really value. We hope all of you had an amazing evening and if you have any questions feel free to stay back and use the chat to ask away. We'd be happy to answer. So we, since we don't see any questions, we'd like to say thank you once again for coming tonight. Have a great night.